Um, the plan this morning, we are going to hear from Michelle Taylor, who is there in Nottingham for us, um, who is going to talk to us. If you can just go on to mute, by the way, if you're not speaking, that would be great. Um, Michelle is going to talk to us about the training that is coming our way towards the end of this month, April. Um, she is from Ramps of the Moon um, and will tell us why it's important and what the training might entail, which is, which is going to be a great offer for people. I know that's already booking up very quickly. We're going to hear from Vega Brennan, who's got some great artist development sessions coming up in Carlisle. Amy Clues from Theatre by the Lake is going to tell us about um, the uh, first, I think, in-person Come and Creatives network meeting that's taking place there. And Rob and Harriet are going to tell us about the second outing for Artful Ways exhibition, which is taking place at Studio Moreland near Penrith um, very soon. So lots to talk about this morning. And as ever, if ever you want to champion something, try and get in touch with me a few days beforehand or a couple of weeks beforehand, ideally. And I can always find five minutes for you to talk about stuff on this call. So that is the plan for this morning. Um, Kate, hello. Nice to see you. You are our chair. Any thoughts? Morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is the bit where we say hello to people who've joined us for the first time. But actually, I don't think anybody has joined us for the first time this morning. But if I'm wrong and you'd like to introduce yourself, do wave now or indicate somehow. Otherwise, if you're feeling a little bit shy, do introduce yourself on chat. No? I think everybody here has been before and, and it's very nice to see everybody too especially on such a sunny morning when I always think everybody's going to disappear up the fells. Uh, thank you for being inside for an hour with us. Carry on then, Tom. We'll make it worth your while, don't you worry. Right, let's kick off with Michelle Taylor. Michelle with an accent that I will learn how to do one day on the first key of her name. Michelle, lovely to have you with us. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank and you. I feel like I should clarify that the accent is on the, the letters, not my voice. <laughs> <laughs> You are in Nottingham, but uh, is Nottingham is that home? Was that where you, is that home for you, Nottingham? Um, it is now. It wasn't originally. I'm a I'm a Surrey girl. Excellent. Um, yeah. So it's really nice to be here, and I've already decided I'm going to move to Cumbria because you're such a nice bunch of people. This is a nice way to spend a Friday morning. So we've been doing this for about just over two years now. I think we're on call number 103 or something like that, Michelle. And it's a chance for us all to kind of learn about stuff and champion stuff going on as well. And also little connections are made all the time. Chat often gets busy. Danielle is always telling us, already telling us that she loves Nottingham. My sister lives in Nottingham, so I go to Nottingham quite a bit and I like Nottingham too, Midduck. Um, right, <laughs> let's hear about, uh, a bit about you, Michelle. I know you've got a background in performance and I think you were a director um, and uh, on stage as well. And you now find yourself making the world a better place, I suspect, by talking about disability equality opportunities uh, across the arts and performance. And I know you've done some work already in Cumbria um, with the Cumbria Museums Consortium. Um, but anyway, tell us a bit about yourself and tell us a bit about the training um, that uh, is gonna be coming up uh, in about three weeks time. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. I'm, I'm very, um, very happy to take this opportunity. So thank you for thank you for the space. So, um, yeah, uh, my name's Michelle um, and uh, I'm disabled. Um, I have a background in theatre as a writer, director and performer, firstly in um, TIE, Theatre and Education, when such a thing existed um, in the good old days, um, and then, and then uh, more generally in, in professional theatre. So that, that was my artistic background. And my journey really was one of um, discovering and coming out, and I use that phrase um, very deliberately, coming out as a disabled person and developing a new and fresh and empowering understanding of what that actually meant, kind of coming from a place of I remember very clearly several several instances of people saying to me things like, oh, but I never think of you as disabled coming from a really good place like being disabled would clearly be a bad thing. So the fact that they never think of me as disabled is clearly a good thing. Um, and kind of coming through that part of my journey and recognizing the, the way in which many 
politically with a small p active disabled people were thinking about disability and how much sense that made and how empowering that was and from a personal journey i took that into a professional journey and i started to work with arts culture heritage organizations uh, across the world actually uh, and have been doing so for 30 years looking at disability equality and more latterly anti-ableism which is kind of a little bit different a little bit further progressed i would say than disability equality and looking at why it's so important um so i've been doing that seven years ago six and a half years ago we started ramps on the moon which is a consortium of mid-scale mainstream theaters that some of you may be aware of and ramps on the moon is about elevating the place of disabled and deaf people in mainstream theater so the focus is on the mainstream ramps on the moon is about the mainstream talking to itself holding a mirror up to itself holding itself to account and saying the disability arts sector shouldn't be the only place where disabled and deaf people get to experience and express our creativity we also have a place in the mainstream and if we don't have a place in the mainstream actually the storytelling within mainstream arts is impoverished it just is that the, if the mainstream arts, uh, culture, heritage sectors are not embracing diversity, and I think that's a word we need to reclaim, if those sectors are not embracing diversity, then the culture that we're making, the culture that we're promoting, the culture that we're encouraging is, is partial. There's, there's kind of no other word for it. It is simply partial. Um, and the training that I will be delivering is going to be looking at principles, tools that you can use to enable you to enact and embody disability equality and anti-ableism in your practice, whatever that practice is and whatever the context of your practice. So if that's an organization, it will be about the importance of embedding anti-ableism throughout an organization. If it's as an individual artist, it will be about what, what you can do as an individual artist to embody and enact this anti-ableist uh, principle and value and approach. And of course, two years ago, we were hit by the realization of the pandemic and what that means. And over the last two years, what we've seen is we've seen the, the progress, the, um, the wins that, that we've had, the, the progress that we've made as disabled and deaf people within mainstream culture eroded. And it's kind of ironic because actually the learning from the pandemic, so much of the learning from the pandemic has been to embrace ways of working that actually make things easier for a lot of disabled and deaf people. And then what is happening as we are being told that the pandemic is over is that that learning is being left behind. It was, it was for then. And there are very few organizations, there are some, but there are very few organizations that are carrying that learning through thoroughly within um, the work that they do. And as deaf and disabled people, what that means is that we're not just being taken back to March 2020, we're being taken back to March 2010, March 2000. You know, we're, 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 going, we're going right back. And one of the frustrations I was talking to Tom um, yesterday about, uh, about what it might be useful to talk to you about this morning, and one of the frustrations um, was March 24th, 2020, so the day after the Prime Minister had told us all we had to stay at home, we had to work from home, and organisations began to set up the systems, the technology, the, the management systems to enable people to work from home. Um, and as disabled people, we were left looking at each other and going, but we've been asking for this for years and we've been being told this isn't possible. And suddenly organizations are turning on a sixpence well, because non-disabled people needed it. And it was deeply frustrating. So it was a kind of bittersweet experience for us. 
And the fact of the pandemic, two facts that's really important, is deaf and disabled people have been massively disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. It's still the case that two thirds of fatalities from COVID are of disabled people. That, that, that statistic still maintains. Um, and uh, the other thing I've completely forgotten, if it's important, it'll come back to me. Um, uh, I, I want I want to, um, uh, Tom and I thought it might be quite useful to do a bit of a Q&A. Before I hand over to Tom to, to chair that, I just want to share with you a, um, a phrase that I have come across so often in the last few years. And it's, you, you may have heard it, it's a phrase that goes something like, access is inviting me to the party. Inclusion is asking me to dance. And I've always felt uncomfortable with that saying. It's always left me feeling really dissatisfied. And I couldn't quite work out why. And then one day I suddenly realized that actually what I want to say in response to that is, but what if I don't like your playlist? What, what if there just simply isn't enough ABBA for me to want to bother to get up and dance? Do you know what? Why can't we create the party together? Why can't we plan the menu, choose the playlist, get hold of a venue? Why can't we plan it together? So if access is inviting me to the party and inclusion is asking me to dance, it seems to me that disability equality is planning a party and then paying me to come and review what you've done and advise you as to how you can do it better. Anti-ableism is us getting together and planning a party from scratch. Seems to me that that's where we're at. So I hope that's enough for now, um, but we've we've got a few more minutes. So I'm gonna hand yeah. back to, to Tom. So I was gonna, my question, I've got two questions for you, Michelle. And then if anybody else wants to ask something, just stick up your hand either electronically or very visually, um, easy for me to see. I, I was going to ask you to just just go over that phrase anti-ableism because it's not one that I'm massively familiar with and I suspect others may not be as well and you, you define it just at the end there but would you just mark, remark, right, just repeat that again anti-ableism what does that actually mean? So anti-ableism in my understanding and and um, you know let's be honest there are lots of different ways of using this language but in my understanding as a general understanding of anti-ableism it takes disability equality one stage further it's way more proactive and it's recognizing that most of us and i say us because as a disabled person this is me too most of us are impacted by stories and one of the things that we will focus on in the training is is the power of stories and storytelling which is our kind of lifeblood as artists and practitioners it's recognizing in exactly the same way as anti-racism recognizes that most of us are immersed in stories about who we are as people and who other people are and, and how that impacts us and racism that and racist uh, assumptions that are, are simply part of who we are in the same way ableist assumptions in other words making having stereotypes of and making assumptions of disabled people is part of who most of us are as well and we need positively and proactively to be interrogating ourselves constantly about what stories our actions and assumptions are based on okay and just on the, on the language theme the other question i had um michelle was we, and again we had a we had a little kind of, you know, conversation about this yesterday. Someone who calls themselves disabled, as opposed to somebody who says, or sorry, if I'm talking about somebody uh, as being disabled, or I'm talking about somebody who has got a disability, from your perspective, there's a fundamental difference there, isn't there? Just, just unpack that for me as well. Yeah, I will. And it's it's really um, at the core of the training, actually, because it's based on the social model of disability. So fundamentally, if I have a disability, it's about me as an individual and anything that, that you do, you being the world in general, does to make my life easier is to help me with my inherent problem, the problem that I have with my body, my medical conditions. If I'm disabled, 
However, what that acknowledges is that it's the way that society is organized and built and designed and run and maintained that disables me. And um, that is really significant um, because it's empowering. Because if the way you organize your workshop or if the way you run your organization or if the way you um, uh uh, it, the way your practice is based disables me, you can do something about it. But if it's all about me and my medical conditions, there's nothing you can do about it. So it's really empowering. That's a very clear definition, Michelle. Thank you for that. And um, as I say, as you said, I'm sure that will come up again and you'll come back to it in the sessions um, that you run towards the end of the month. OK, we've got about sort of... Um, five or ten minutes if anybody wants to ask any questions or just run something past Michelle um, then now is the time to do that uh, either just raise your hand or electronically um, can I ask you but before we do Kate just tell us a bit more about why why you've invited Michelle to come and do this in Cumbria um, you know now okay well in, in short because she's brilliant <laughs> <laughs> that's a given no, it's totally true so we we uh, I attended this session um, a year ago, maybe uh, something like that, through something called the Curating for Change program, which uh, the museums that I work with are involved in. And that's a program which is about creating more opportunities for disabled curators uh, in museums. And it's a brilliant project that I'm really happy to be part of. So we did that training uh, as part of the project. And then I decided that I was so, so impressed by it and so interested by it that I wanted to run it for people across Cumbria Museum Consortium. So 90 staff have already attended that and the feedback has been amazing. And then when we were lucky enough to get the funding from Sellafield Limited to, um, you know, to support the Cumbria Arts and Culture Network, the, the first thing I wanted to do was to expand that even further across the network. And it is actually something that when we've asked people in the network what sort of training they wanted, this is precisely the sort of thing that has been specifically requested. So, oh, thank you very much indeed, Caroline from Cumbria Deaf Association, who's kindly put the link in chat. That's that's really kind of you because I, Amy, our administrator, is not here to do it today. Thank you. And um, so that's where you can book. Uh, the, the courses are on the 25th, 26th, 27th and 28th of April at different times of the day. Um, they are booking up really fast, especially the ones in the morning. So do hop on there and book quickly. Um, so yeah, that, that's why. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions from anyone? Lana, hopefully you can get onto that link and uh, find out about how you can get involved in it. I'm just looking around the screen. I think one to two screens now. because One or two people joined us recently. Danielle, off you go. Hi there. Um, I'm excited about this uh, this talk today. So um, anyway, so um, the uh, training sessions that you've been doing, um, do you say it was over the last year or year or, or seven years? The positive uh, response from the arts, culture, heritage organisations. What feedback have you got from those leaders in what changes they've made? to be more inclusive, more responsive, more understanding of access needs, reducing barriers to include a variety of people. Um, that's one bit. And then, um, and then also the feedback from the practitioners and audience for the access. Thank you, Danielle. Kate, do you want to pick, Michelle, do you want to pick up? And Kate might have a view about um, what's changed as a result of the training. Go, off you go, Michelle. Um, uh, so, uh, thank you, Danielle. I think, I mean, I could talk about this for the rest of the day, um, but I think in summary, the, the key bit of feedback is, oh, it's not that hard, is it? I think one of one of my one of my fundamental aims is to demystify this whole thing. I think it's made so complicated 
and um, so difficult to even talk about. And one of the things that I really emphasize during the training is, please don't worry about language, let's just have the conversation. We could talk about language, but for now, please don't worry about the words that you're using. And it feels really important to just say to people, you're not gonna do this overnight. You're not gonna, there is no such thing as getting this right. It genuinely is a journey rather than a destination, but there's a lot you, you can get right on that journey. And, and it's, it's fundamentally about just relaxing and doing what you do. Um, and it's a really useful tool to improve your practice still further generally. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And the second part of the question comes to Derek next and then Jill, but Kate, do you wanna just pick up on as a result of the training that's taken place already, what, what's changed? I think it, it relates to what Michelle was just saying about people realizing that, that sometimes it's the tiniest little things that can make huge differences. And um, I don't, I can see Jill Goodfellow, my colleague at Tully House, has got her hand up. I wonder if she's going to give an illustration of, of tiny things that have made a difference. Um, and because they're tiny, they're very doable. The things are doable, you know. Um, we can all make a difference. I think that's what we have understood. But Michelle and I have had this conversation that, you know, what happens when you train 90 people in one place? We, we want to ask ourselves that question uh, in due course, you know, with, with such a lot of people having been through the training, what's the impact? Uh, we, we need to know. But it's, uh, so that's one of the things that we'll be doing soon. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Danielle. Derek and then Jill. Derek, off you come. Off you come off mute. Yes, thank you. I, I, I'm interested in the, the idea of definition. It seems to me that we are in a, in a time when we're very much either or. You're either for this or you're against it. You're either able-bodied or you're disabled. And that seems to me to neglect the, the extraordinary range of people's abilities and the extraordinary range of people's views and potentials. My, my father was disabled, so I, I have a particular, um, I'm not going to say insight, but interest in this. Do, do you think that is part of the whole issue? So I'm just going to pick up there because the, the sound wasn't great, but basically Derek was talking about, you know, we talk, society these days is very much either or, black or white. Um, yes or no, and actually is disability and being disabled much more nuanced than that? And how do we how do we go about, I suppose, managing that and, and dealing with that? Michelle, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I will very happily. Um, yeah, absolutely. I couldn't couldn't agree more. I think it's interesting that as as someone who's um uh visibly disabled and as someone who experiences barriers um kind of constantly 24-7, then actually the the um saying that I'm a disabled person is really important to me to express something of what my experience is as I navigate this world. However, the social model of disability, which is the core of the training session, a way of thinking about disability that is empowering and gives you a, a set of tools to, to check um, uh, your practice. One of the fundamental things that the social model says is, I don't need to know if you call yourself disabled or not. I just need to know whether the experience that you're having is a good one. And if it isn't, then is there anything that I could do to make it a better one? So the social model of disability is not a binary. It's not if you're disabled, then we'll do something. If you're not disabled, then sorry, you're on your own. Um, it's it's very much folk because it focuses on my practice as an artist or a curator or um, a front of house person at a theatre or whoever it might be it's about my practice and how I work so it's not about how individuals define themselves thank you Michelle Jill hello hello again Michelle nice to see you hi Jill um, so I was part of the CMC training that, that uh, Michelle did and I just wanted to kind of follow up on what Danielle was saying and and say that so I'm at Tully House um, <clears throat> And lots of our staff had this training and I sit on the equality and inclusion uh, committee at Tully House and I can say that there's been a total shift in the way that we think about 
that practice and our access practice since Michelle's um, training. We don't, we don't, we're not trying to get bogged down by thinking about every, like the social model says it kind of, there is a medical condition and then we are the ones that are disabling. So instead of getting bogged down with each individual medical condition we look at each thing we do and say right what barriers are we putting in place here and we're currently working on a big regeneration project and we've had a lot of meetings with architects and designers and things like that and it's been so heartening that it isn't just our community team because for many years it has fallen to our excellent community team to put their hands up and go hang on that's not that might cause a problem we're seeing it across the board. The curators are saying it, the front of house people are saying it, the finance people are saying it, you know, and it's so nice that actually we're kind of holding a mirror up. And it's one of the things I mentioned in uh, the training with Michelle. Sometimes as arts organizations, I don't know if anyone else experiences this, we feel a little bit woke and a little bit, you know, when we're talking to contractors and architects, it's almost like, we the example I gave was the the VDA the Disability Discrimination Act that's kind of the, the standard that our contractors and that our uh, architects work to but it's not good enough uh, for what we do and we're now able because more of the organization are saying it we're, we're holding that mirror up and we're challenging our architects to do a better job. And so I just wanted to say thank you so much to Michelle and to Kate for organizing it because I can see in the short time we've had since that, that it's actually gonna make a real difference to people in our community who need us to be better. That's so exciting. Thank you, Jill. No, so well, great to hear that. Yeah, no, thank you. It has, it's been excellent. We've, we've had the first round of well it's about the 10th round of consultations but the first one since your training and it was different it was very different and it was great lovely words to hear on a friday morning thank you very much jill no we have time for one more question uh and that's going to be from helen pets helen off you go come off mute helen I should have said, come off mute, Helen, please. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, I was actually going to say what Jill just said. I, I did a course with Michelle a few years ago and it was brilliant. And I, I've got a medical condition that buggers up my memory. And I can't remember whether she was the first person I did it with or the second. But the first time I did disability awareness training, I discovered I was disabled and I was completely in denial about it. And that term coming out was was really quite amazing for me it changed my life it really did and and you know I, I, it, it, I have a lot of moans about the way that arts organizations put into practice their disability equality because I don't look disabled and they want to be seen to be working with people who are you know who look disabled then they can get their brownie points but we can discuss that on the, the training course when I do it um, but um, it's great to see you Michelle and um, you don't look a day older I don't know you've done it <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, I'm gonna come every Friday morning <laughs> so you're doing very well this morning Michelle <laughs> and the training sold out as we've been online how exciting uh, is that thank you Helen that's very kind <laughs> that's great to hear Helen and uh, uh, yeah I'd endorse everything that uh, that Michelle's just said there that's lovely right um just to wrap up this section then uh Michelle any final thoughts looking forward to it I'm really looking forward to it yeah I mean I genuinely genuinely have to say that the two rounds of of training that the round of training that I that I did um in Cumbria um was was with some of the most responsive groups that I've ever worked with. So that's really, really exciting. And that's been uh, endorsed and confirmed this morning by people's reactions to, to the training and what impact that's had in the organization. So, um, so thank you. And I'm really looking forward to the next few sessions. Excellent. And thank you for your time this morning, Michelle. And Kate, I think you want to say a word about uh, the, the courses and booking up and all that sort of stuff. Well, yeah, that, um, obviously I'm pleased that they've booked up, but we want, you know, we wanted to get as many people as we can onto them so that there are waiting lists. It will be important for people to say if they're unable to attend so that we can get somebody on the waiting list into a course 
but I, I will also talk to Michelle about whether we can maybe manage another one. Um, I'll have that conversation offline with you, Michelle, because, you know, when there's enthusiasm like this, I really don't want to um, nip it in the bud. Um, if we can squeeze the money out of the budget, we will. Thanks, everybody. Great. And Kate, thank you for taking the lead on choosing to organise this for the network as well. And I just endorse again, um, if you are signed up, please, please, please do turn up. Or if you know you're not going to be able to turn up, please let um, Amy or Kate know so that we can give that place to somebody else, because uh, it would be such a shame if um, there, were, there were spaces because people didn't turn up. So thank you again uh, for that conversation this morning. Thanks to all those contributions from people. Some nice stuff in chat as well. Right, it's six minutes past ten. We're going to go to Carlisle now and we're going to go to Vega Brennan, who is organising some really exciting sounding sessions to help with artist development. So I shall get your slides up, Vega, and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, I run a very small print studio up in Carlisle. And um, before lockdown, I was running artist development courses as well. And they were extremely popular. I was really surprised by how popular they were. And um, they were based on Julie Cameron's The Artist's Way. I don't know if anyone's heard of the book. Um, so this is my prop here. Anyone can see that. Um, and it's like a 12 week course. I, well, there's eight sessions over 12 weeks and it takes anybody who's interested in creative practice. So I've had um, musicians, I've had textile artists, photographers, poets, enrolling on this course and just getting an awful lot out of it. So after lockdown, I thought I'd scale it up. So I've, um, I'm working with the Whistling Crew at Creative Quarter. So the lovely um, Catherine Simmons and Scott Wigglesworth and Tommy Newell um, have helped me set this up. And um, the next slide shows the lovely space that it's going to take place in. Um, that's obviously set up for a theater um, event, but it gives me the space to do something much bigger. Um, so the course is structured, so it's always on a Monday evening, and it's one and a half hours, and generally the first sort of half of the session is talking and talking about the theory of creative practice, and then the second half of the session is always a very open, um, physical, exploratory, open-ended um, thing. It's really difficult to describe, and I just, I don't know why I still don't know why, but I think that people really enjoy it. And I think it's the community. I think it's the support and also um, just people giving themselves permission to become the artist that they want to be. Um, so that's kind of it. Um, it's £150 for the eight sessions. Um, and there are concessions. So I've, um, it's half price for students and people on benefits. And um, yeah, so that's about it. Um, if you like, who would you say is it? So if it was aimed at anybody in particular, who would you say the target audience for the sessions is? Sometimes I say it's a bit like um, AA for artists. So anyone who's kind of like sort of stopped their practice for whatever reason, like work or family has got in the way, or they're kind of starting out but don't really know how to find their feet. Um, it's it's very difficult to describe, but I think people come to the course if it's the right thing for them. And, you know, having a look through Julia Cameron's um, website and having a look through the book is probably a useful place to start. But we pretty much kind of like go off piste with that as well, because there's some bits in it that are really useful, but then I bring in an awful lot more to make it a really sort of well-rounded course. Excellent. Well, thank you for organising it. Good luck with it. Thank Big you. Big thumbs up from Alex there. Um, and just again, the first date at Vega, just remind us what the first date um, will be. I think it's the 26th of April. So I'm terrible with dates. Um, if you go on my website um, or if you go on the um, Whistling Cruise website, you'll find the, the full dates on there. And we're going to stick to those dates. Um, and if any venues would like leaflets, then please send me a message and I will post a handful of leaflets out to you. Um, but please share and please tell as many people as possible. So okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, very Good luck with that. Right, uh, Artful Ways is on the road and Kate is going to tell us a bit about that. Kate, off you go. <laughs> well, I'm going to introduce two people who can say more about it than me, but you'll remember the uh, fabulous exhibition uh, that happened in the autumn. 
uh, at Tully House. Well, it's on the road now and heading to Studio Moreland, isn't it? Here are Rob and Harriet Fraser, who are going to tell us much more about it. Good morning to both of you. Hi, guys. Hello. Uh, Tom, can you get them slides up, please? I certainly can. Yeah, so we're going to take you back to the hazy, hazy days of last summer, which feels like a long time ago now. Um, Artful Ways Cumbria, uh, that project that um, the network successfully helped get off the ground, basically. Uh, Harriet and I were just pushed from behind to make it happen ultimately, but it was um, it felt like a, a lot of really good energy. Next slide, please, Tom. So it was about several strands really bringing together. Um, and one of the main strands was these walks that we organized across the county. We did about seven walks, including with Great Place Lakes and Dales. Uh, Harriet and I did some walks as part as the um, Estelle Festival in early July. Uh, and we went to uh, Warney Island, where Maddie Nicholson took us around and showed us what Art Gene were doing with that landscape. Um, art was kind of a, a backdrop, really, for getting people to socialise, uh, whether they're uh, identified as artists or not. So it was about bringing people together once more. Um, so that was a really, really good element of the, of the project. Next slide, please, Tom. Um, yeah, here's a, a map. People were digitally mapping their walks um, and people who chose to take part but didn't walk were adding themselves to the map digitally. Um, and you can see the little boxes. Um, the project was also asking people how they related to place and, and what mattered to them about art and, and about the environment. Um, so it had a digital element as well as a physical element. So when um, restrictions lifted and we were able to show the exhibition, we, we did, um, we had a lot of contributions of artwork from people around the county and some people just over the border as well, because hey, borders are made up, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, borders are made up. Um, so uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so there you go, there's a gallery on the website. Please go along and have a look, have a look at the work that people made in response to this project and the really thoughtful pieces of writing that people submitted or films or audio pieces. Um, please go along and have a look. And then the actual physical exhibition, as you say, is coming to the studio in Moreland. Maybe the next slide. No, it won't be. No? No. Ah, the commissions. Go, Rob. Yeah, so we, we set out with an idea of giving commissions out to um, five artists. There was one kind of big commission, which Alex um, got and did a marvellous job. Uh, and as did the, the other four artists spread across the county, a uh, really diverse range of um, responses to place, to journeys, to being involved with in Cumbria. So if, just refresh yourself, go on the website, see what the, the, those artists got up to. Yeah, Alex reflected on all of the contributions to the project, which was a massive piece of work and, and I think quite a enjoyable thing to be doing, whereas the others did their own artful ways and reflected on that. Yeah, um, next slide, please, Tom. And it came, um, nice to see Jill this morning uh, and it came to Tully House. It opened alongside the, the New Lights Art Prize exhibition um, in the wonderful space there and had a really good run at Tully House um, last autumn. So we were really heartened by the response that we received back at that. Um, so that was a really, really good way of introducing it to the county. Um, next slide, please. So now the next run of its tour is very short, but very sweet at Studio Moreland. Uh, so the dates in red there are when the exhibition is going to be open to the general public. Harriet and I will be there with Kate uh, this coming Sunday uh, to actually install it. Um, it won't be the full exhibition, unfortunately, because the space is a little bit smaller there. But we'll so get as much as we'll we get can. as much as we can. Um, so we'll be there on that that Sunday. Uh, we'll have Kate. So if anybody wants to come along with a with an eye and a, a, a set of new jokes, because my jokes are wearing thin at the moment, then please, please do come along. My mobile number's at the bottom there, so if you want to text, if you can come along, um, great. And there's loads of uh, lovely things to do in Moreland, so you can pop in and see us for a bit and then spend a bit more time. In the yeah, so we'll be, um, what's that word when you sit in? Invigilating. Invigilating, that word. We'll be invigilating on some of the days, but on other days, Alex will be there. And Amy's story is taking one of the sessions as well. So be either one of us will be there actually in the space to talk about the exhibition and just have a chat, really. Yeah, so do get in touch if you really want to spend a bit of time with Alex talking about how she responded um, to the project and what her piece means and what she learned. It'd be great to turn up while she's invigilating. Um, so, yeah, do get in touch, pop into chat um, and, yeah, stay in touch with us all. 
and we'd love to see as many people there as possible. Um, we are toying with the idea of um, an Easter Sunday kind of open, um, generally inviting people to come along and have fun, but just come along whenever you can, because there'll be people there, there'll be chat, there'll be um, time to be had. Yeah. Next slide, please, Tom. So from uh, Studio Moreland later on this year, it goes to Florence Arts Centre uh, between those dates. Uh, and then we've... Uh, That's May the 14th May th to June the 19th. And then uh, Low Size of Barn. We've been in conversation with them. It's a cafe, if you don't know it, it's on the edge of Kendall, just off the, the main... Uh, what's the name of the road? Is it the A595 or A591? A591, and that's October the 18th to November the 29th. Yeah, so that's an entirely different space. So it's not a traditional gallery um, setting at all. It's a cafe. Um, so you get a lot of the general public going through there who will experience uh, a, the art of Cumbria that's been diverse, as I said before, um, across that county during that one month last year. And the final slide, please, Tom, I think. Not the final slide, there's one more to go. So that's just the stats um, of what's what happened, um, what the response has been, and how it got out there. Uh, I think it's really good that 204 days from the submission, we were opening the exhibition at Tally House, and that just shows sometimes that you can do, uh, ha can have an idea, submit it, and enact it quite quickly. Um, that's quite quick, I believe, in, in uh, those kind of terms. Yeah, we had a lot of on online engagement, um, but a lot of, of physical engagement too. I think Jill will be able to tell you how many people visited at Tully House. Um, Probably Studio not now, but... Yeah, Studio <laughs> Moreland, of course, it's got a shorter run, but we're going for quality, uh, not quantity when it comes to days. So look at your diary. And I'm aware we didn't read those dates out when it's open at the Studio Moreland for people who are following the transcript. Apologies about that. April 6th, 7th, April the 9th and 10th, April the 13th and 14th, and the 16th and 17th. Go on to the website and you will see all the details and there are links to Studio Moreland from there. So, Have we got the website on the last slide, Tom? No, we got thanks on the last slide. Oh, we got slide. thanks. <laughs> yeah, I mean- <laughs> Thank it, you, everyone. It just acknowledges the, 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 the breadth of talent and people and organizations that got, got behind the, the project, including all the artists, and non-artists, you know, a lot of non-artists actually took part in the project as well. Um, so it was a really, really, really good response. And um, it just shows you that you get an, a good idea, I suppose, and, and people will get behind it. And who doesn't love a walk, actually? Who doesn't what, love a walk or a stroll in the countryside? Or a poem. Or a, or poem. a picture or a film. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. And uh, if anybody else needs to know any other road numbers in Cumbria, sounds like uh, Harriet knows most of them. Uh, I, I was thinking about testing you, Harriet, on numbers, but I won't, but perhaps another day. Uh, she's good at 591s versus 595s. Um, you you um, can ask me numbers, but don't ask me for directions. <laughs> <laughs> Just very briefly, we've got two minutes, Rob and Harriet. What else are you up to? What else is somewhere, nowhere doing at the moment? Oh, God. you've always got about 20 things on the go. <laughs> Give us your top three. Uh, top three, we are um, working with a selection of other artists and some scientists and um, ecologists on a peat bog in North Cumbria to uh, bring the story of a restored peat bog to life. We're working in the uplands actually around England, um, trying to kind of find out more and tell stories about how things work there where there's a big kind of fine balance. Yeah, and next um, week we're doing a four-day walk along a section of the Thames Path as part of a project we're working on in the Thames Valley about natural flood management. Yeah, need the space to write a poem. Yeah. You know, you've got to slow down sometimes. Yeah, and Harriet's doing a PhD, although it's no, on, not. on hold a little bit at the moment <laughs> yeah. for various reasons. But um, yeah, so we, and there's a couple of other projects which have popped up as well, which we're going to be working on. Excellent. That sounds like a busy life. And the curlews, are they, are they all right near you? They're... They're, they're, they're not, back. They're not. They're back, but they're not so vocal that, at the moment. Maybe they're a bit cold. I eh? think maybe they're a bit cold. Yeah, they'll, be, maybe, they'll be sheltering from the snow and the hail. They'll be there. Fingers crossed. Touch wood. All that sort of stuff. Yes. yes. Good luck with um, Artful Ways. It's a great exhibition. Jill's put there three thousand and twenty-four visitations um, to Tully House. Very, she's hot. That Jill. She knows. She knows her stuff. She knows her stuff. It was probably there, wasn't it, Jill? Right. <laughs> I just knew it. But yeah, um, any questions about Artful Ways, please um, do ask. And also, just in in the spirit of the network and helping each other out, um, Rob and I have been a, a bit snowed under with things. But if you go to the exhibition, please uh, tweet about it, Facebook about it, get the word out on social media, and um, 
it's always been a community project, so please uh, help us tell the story. Okay, about it. Danielle, Danielle just asks, will the Artful Ways ex exhibition be coming to the Barrow Dalton area? No. Good question, Danielle. Let's have a conversation. I know we've go. talked about this in the past, so um, we've got to see what we can manage. Okay, and Lorna just saying, I love my walk. Really looking forward to seeing all the exhibition again. Thanks, Fraser's and uh, Alex. Hugely yeah. enjoyed the project. Big thank you to CACN and Rob and Harriet. So again, great stuff. Great stuff when we work together and collaborate and network and make things happen. Right. Uh, let's now go to Keswick and Theatre by the Lake and Amy Clues who is going to tell us a little bit about a great network that started off, I think, just as the pandemic hit or soon afterwards, and possibly has never met face to face. I can't remember. Amy will fill us in, but I think there's a plan to do something about that. So, Amy, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Tom. Oh, goodness. Can everybody else hear that weird robot noise? Oh, it's gone. Nope. Okay. okay. Just me. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'm Amy. I'm the producer over at Theatre by the Lake. If we haven't met, hello. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of you will probably be aware, but if you're not, uh, a couple of years ago, so before my time in Keswick, um, our artistic director set up um, the Cumbrian Creatives Network, which is uh, roughly a, an attempt on behalf of Theatre by the Lake to provide information, networking, uh, opportunities um, and support to local artists of all disciplines. But obviously a lot of the things that we're doing have a performance or theatrical kind of bias or bent to them. Um, so that network, yeah, two years ago was set up just pre-pandemic because their first proper event was a scratch night in March uh, 2020. And then uh, there were lots of plans over 2020 and 2021. We kept planning events in person, kept planning them and cancelling them and planning them and cancelling them for reasons that I'm sure you all recognise. Um, so we've decided now is the time. And April the 12th, uh, put it in your diary, Tuesday, April the 12th, we'll be doing our first post-pandemic in-person mixer. So the network currently has kind of over 300 members of all disciplines, as I said, and, and one of the when people sign up to the network and I'll, in fact I'll plop some these will all make sense in a minute but there's a load of links in the chat um when you sign up to the network then then you you write a little something to tell us a bit about yourself and the most overwhelming uh thing that people told us was that, was that they thought that they were the only artist in the county or they were the only person doing the thing they they did and they didn't know anyone else I mean this was before uh, CACN uh, so I think I think those networks are, are becoming more uh, developed, but at the time, and you know, we still get people saying, oh, "I think I'm the only writer actually who writes plays in in this county." Um, so we thought that uh, networking and putting people in touch with each other in order to find collaborators, co-conspirators, future project uh, uh, collaborators would be a great thing to do. So yeah, Tuesday the twelfth uh, between five and six thirty at the theatre, and it's deliberately at that time um, this time because we've got a matinee, and we've got an evening performance. So for people who are making a big journey, they can potentially fit in a couple of pieces of theatre and then a mixer in the middle. Um, there will be food of some kind. There'll be drinks of some kind. I'll be there with a glass of warm sticky white wine uh, trying to find someone to talk to me and there'll probably be some kind of hopefully not too cringe encouragement to talk to one another of some kind. These I know these mixes and networking events can be absolutely oh um, but we'll try our best and if you really don't want to be involved in, in any of that then there'll be me with my wine there'll be Claire Dunk who a lot of you know and there'll be Simon McElligot who's our new community's lead at the theatre as well so we'll all be there to talk to the people who don't want to talk to anyone else um, so please do come along if you uh, if you want to then I've put Claire's email address in the chat claire.dunk at theatrebythelake.com and you can just bob her an email because uh, if you're not on the network, you won't have um, have got the, the invite because it was network only. You can also join the network uh, through the link theaterbythelake.com forward slash get involved forward slash artist dash development or network or something like that. So you can sign up to the network there. And then I've just popped a couple of links in for the two plays that are on that day. So there's Swim in the studio at two o'clock, uh, which is a great piece by a Cumbrian artist called Liz Richardson about wild swimming, about grief, about motherhood, family, community. It's beautiful. We're in tech at the moment, so I'm tired, but it's very good. 
and um, and also a piece called Kez. Uh, we all know the Kez story. It's a co-pro with Bolton, three-hander, very unusually told, beautiful music that's on in the evening at 7.30. So that's the, the, the mixer. Um, a couple of other things I just wanted to say was a big thanks to everybody who came to the Cumbrian Creative Scratch Night last week, um, where we had uh, work from five local artists um, and a wonderful, wonderful warm audience who gave brilliant feedback and encouragement to those artists. So we, we do those kind of twice a year. So again, keep your eye on the network for those um, paid micro commissioning opportunities. And again, join the network. Coming up, we've got some uh, opportunities. We're opening up our kind of tech process for those who are interested in how we put work on the main stage and how that kind of from the end of rehearsals to when you come and see it in the audience happens. Uh, we've got our regular monthly kind of walk and talks where people from the building are available to just uh, answer any questions, help with any Arts Council applications or with how do I do this thing or this thing. Uh, we've got a great new opportunity for writers coming up and we've also got some space available in the building that we're just throwing out to local artists over the summer. So join the network for any of those bits and bobs. And if you have any questions, just drop me a line. Thank you, Amy. Lovely Thanks, stuff. Amy. Liz Richardson, hopefully, by the way, is coming on next Friday on this call to talk about Fantastic. swim. Fantastic. Uh, oh, good so, stuff. So, fingers crossed, she'll, she'll tell us a bit about that. Um, and I can see the People's Republic of Barrow are hard at work trying to get um, Artful Ways to come to the south of the county. So we'll see whether that happens. Uh, the, the Barrow Massive <laughs> is in communication. Right. Uh, it's, what, 26 minutes past 10. So we're almost there. Uh, Kate, some final thoughts from you as our chair. I think it's been a really special one this morning. It's always great to see everybody on Friday morning, but some such a lot of thoughtful interaction this morning, which I just love. So thank you, everybody, for that. Um, yeah, the really the really good news for the network, uh, which you might have picked up in the newsletter, um, is that we now have um, three members of freelance staff across our lovely network, thanks to the Sellafield funding. Um, Mr. Tom Spate is now our content producer. Um, Mr. Chris Bridgman is now our development producer and Amy Story continues as our um, amazing administrator. So it feels great. Uh, we've been through uh, you know, a, a rigorous process and clearly Tom is the best person to continue to do these Friday calls. Um, it feels great to have that capacity um, and to be able to sort of move on now. One of the things that we'll be doing is, is constituting uh, CACN and setting up as a CIO, um, our own little charity. So there's a lot happening, lots of good stuff coming and lots of work going on behind the scenes and we will obviously keep you posted. So congratulations to Tom and to Chris. And uh, thank you to Amy. You're not here, but I know you'll see this recording. Thank you to you for all the amazing stuff you do behind the scenes. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to swim on Saturday evening at Bids by the Lake. That's going to be great. I hope we maybe see you there, Amy. OK, thanks, Tom. Thank you, Kate. Um, next week, hopefully, if the, if the money has been paid into the meter <laughs> and the birds are sitting on the wire correctly, we are going to cross live to Venice next Friday to see what on earth Daniel Ibbotson is up to with his exhibition there. So fingers crossed, we're gonna be live in Venice. Well, not I'm not gonna be in Venice, but Daniel will be. And we'll see what's going on with his exhibition there. <laughs> You'll remember that he's he's got a great uh, commission to do some stuff there. So that should be exciting. Nick Turner uh, of Intro Fame is gonna tell us about a new art, um, uh, not exhibition, kind of festival that's gonna planned for Carlisle for the summer as well for the Heritage Quarter in Carlisle. And as mentioned before, hopefully Liz Richardson will tell us all about Swim, the lovely new play that's just about to open at Theatre by the Lake in Keswick. So it should be a good one next Friday as well. Lovely to see you all. Thank you to Michelle, to uh, Vega, to Amy, and to Robin Harriet for telling us about all the stuff going on. Book up for those sessions, the disability session, disability equality sessions. If you can squeeze in on some of those, we'll see what we can do about that. And again, thank you for choosing to spend an hour with everybody else on a Friday morning. Uh, it's always great to see all the faces of Cumbria on, and beyond on this call. Thanks, everybody. See you again soon. Bye-bye.